Amen. All right, turn with me to Matthew 17. There are many scenes in the Gospels and in the book of Acts that I would love to have seen firsthand. And you look at all these things that Jesus did. You look at how the church, you know, just was spread throughout the book of Acts. And it would be so amazing to see these things with our own eyes. And I don't know, maybe when we get to heaven, we'll somehow get to see those, you know, events in real time. I don't know how it all works out, but uh, if we do, I'd love to see the transfiguration of Jesus. That's what we looked at last week. Jesus going on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he gets up on the top of the mountain, and he's transformed, metamorphosized before them. And Elijah and Moses appear, and Peter's all excited. Oh, let's just stay here, Lord. Let's build three tabernacles, three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And, and then God has to interrupt Peter. It says, while he's still speaking, God says, this is my beloved son, hear him. And so Peter gets quiet and they all hit the ground because God speaks to you directly like that. I think you're going to be face down on the ground. And so they were on the ground. Jesus comes over and he touches them and he says, get up, arise, don't be afraid. And it says they lifted up their eyes and they saw no one but Jesus only. And, and that's really the key. When everything is just troubling, you're afraid, whatever you're going through, look to the Lord. Look up and see Jesus Christ. So we pick up in verse 9 of chapter 17, and we see an interesting discussion um, with Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, as they come down from this mountain. It says, Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now, again, I can imagine that Peter, James, and John were very quiet as they make this long trek from this high mountain that they were just on. You know, God says, this is my Son, whom I will please listen to him. Jesus touches them, don't be afraid. And I'm sure they were still in a state of shock as they're coming down the mountain, very quiet, following Jesus down the hill, or mountain, it says. And this is incredible, because they've been with Jesus for about three years now. He's entering the last six months or so of his earthly ministry, and they've seen him do every sign, you know, miracle, all the wonders he did, raising people from the dead, and cleansing lepers, all that stuff, opening up blind eyes, casting out demons, but they had never seen Jesus do something like this you know, transformed in glory before them. I mean, this is taking that relationship to a whole new level. And so as they're coming down the mountain, he, Jesus breaks the silence. Literally, he commands them. He gives them this command, don't tell anybody what you've just seen until after I have been risen from the dead. Now, why did Jesus tell them that? Because these disciples are a lot like us. They're blabbermouths. <laughs> they couldn't keep that to themselves. Are you kidding me? I'm sure that was the first thing they wanted to tell the guys when they got back down from the mountain. It's in Mark chapter 9, verse 10. Look at this verse. We're given a little more information about what's going through their minds when Jesus said this. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. Why do you suppose these disciples were questioning what rising from the dead meant? After all, these guys are Orthodox Jews, and as all the Orthodox Jews believed, there is a general resurrection in the last days. There's a resurrection when all people will be raised up, some to righteousness, some to Un, or because of righteousness, some because of unrighteousness, some will go to heaven, some will go to Sheol or the grave or ultimately hell. But that's why the disciples are questioning among themselves what this means. The Greek text gives us a little bit more understanding because the Greek where he says risen from the dead or out from the dead, it's ek, E-K, which is out from, necros, which is the dead. So he's coming out from among the dead. That's the literal translation of what Jesus says here. So when he, they're questioning, what do you mean that you're going to come out from among the dead? That's a concept they were not familiar with. 
Again, all the Jews believed in that general resurrection. Job, this is what he tells us, Job 19, starting in verse 25. Uh, you know, Job is called one of the most righteous men in the, in the Bible. It says, For I know that my Redeemer lives. Job is probably the first book written, dated before the uh, five books that Moses wrote. But I know my Redeemer lives. The Redeemer is Jesus. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Amazing. He was yearning even then to see the Lord in glory. Another one that's called one of the most righteous men of all time was Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Daniel says, And many of those who slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so that's the general view of all the Jewish people. They looked for one resurrection way down the road in the last days. Everybody would be raised up, and then they'll be separated, the righteous and the unrighteous. We also see the uh, Jewish way of thinking with Lazarus. Remember when Martha sent for Jesus. Jesus is down by the Jordan River, and he gets word that Lazarus is sick, and so he chooses to stay a couple days longer because he wanted Lazarus to be nice and ripe in the tomb. Four days he's been in the tomb. And so he comes up there, and this is what we read in John 11, starting in verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Again, that's how most Jews viewed the resurrection, the last day. He'll be raised up. Yeah, I don't question that. One event, end of time. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So even if we die, we're not going to die. Physically, yes, but to take your last breath on earth, you're going to be taking your first breath in glory. To be absent from the body, Paul says, to be present with the Lord. So Jesus is introducing a whole new concept concerning their understanding of the resurrection. Yes, there is a resurrection in the life. Yes, there is a resurrection unto damnation. The New Testament tells us that there are going to be two resurrections. We know the resurrection to life is called the first resurrection. That's for believers. And then there's a resurrection to death, also known as the second death. It's a resurrection when all the unrighteous will be taken up and stand at the great white throne and they'll be sentenced to the lake of fire. So we don't want anybody to go there. But the first resurrection is for all those whom God has declared righteous. When you study this out, you'll find that the first resurrection is a category. It is not a one-time event. It takes place in various stages, the first resurrection. Jesus is the first one to rise from the dead. He's called the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. Then the next group of believers who are going to rise up with resurrection bodies is the bride of Christ. That could happen at any moment. That's called the rapture. All those from Pentecost to the rapture is the bride of Christ. And we will all be taken together. The dead in Christ rise first, and we will ever remain. We caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. At the end of the Great Tribulation, that seven-year period of destruction when God's wrath is being poured out, at the end of that, we're told that those who get saved during the Great Tribulation, known as Tribulation Saints, at that point, they'll be given their resurrection bodies. Those who have died because they resisted the Antichrist, they refused the mark of the beast. And so when Jesus returns, I encourage you to read you know, Revelation 19. We see Jesus descending from heaven, who's following with him on white horses. We are. The armies of the Lord, clothed in fine linen, bright and clean. A couple of verses earlier it says the fine linen, bright and clean, are the righteous acts of the saints. It's us coming back with the Lord. 
And, and so he comes back, he throws the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. Satan gets locked up for a thousand years, but it's the return of Christ that the group of people known as tribulation saints will be raised from the dead. They're not the church, but they get saved during the great tribulation. Look at this verse, Revelation 20, verse 4. It tells us, again, this is the Apostle John speaking, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. A quick study through Revelation, especially chapters 2 and 3, Jesus says, To those who overcome, they will sit with me on my throne. We're given new garments. We will also be judging others. So that part, that's the church sitting on these thrones. Judgment was committed to them. Then, John says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, that's another name for the Antichrist, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. That's 666. Remember Revelation 13, 18. And you can't buy or sell unless you have that mark. And so those who refuse the mark of the beast, they'll be beheaded, it says here. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so they come to faith in Jesus during that seven-year period. And then they're given their resurrection bodies and they will enter into the millennial reign of Christ. When you look at the timing of these events, the Old Testament saints get raised up right around that same time because they will enter into the millennial reign of Christ. And then at the end of the thousand years, there are going to be those who enter into the millennium. The thousand-year reign of Christ, they go in, they survive the Great Tribulation, and they'll enter into their natural bodies. They'll live for many, many years. Many will live that whole thousand years. And at the end of that, they're given resurrection bodies. So the first resurrection unto life. Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, millennial saints. But there's only one bride of Christ, those who get saved between Pentecost and the rapture. So these various saints, these resurrections, they're all part of the first resurrection. Again, when you study it out, they will have a unique relationship with Jesus. We'll all, all have our own special ministry during the millennium with the Lord. The Apostle Paul gives us some insights into this. Look at these verses, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, that means all of us who've been born, since Adam and Eve were created, they sin. So in Adam, we're all born in Adam. We're all born of the physical body. We were born in sin. That's why everybody dies, Right? Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Who's in Christ? Only those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. You are in Christ. He's in you. You are in Christ. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. But notice, Paul says, but each one in his own order. So there's an order of resurrections. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at His coming is perusia, which is an all-encompassing term for when Christ returns, first for His bride, then at the, the end of the Great Tribulation. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father and when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So bottom line is you want to be part of the first resurrection. But the fact of the matter is the bride of Christ is only made up of believers from, i got to emphasize this, Pentecost, that's when the church was born. The rapture is when the church ends. The church is the bride of Christ, the, the body of Christ. And, and then when he's done with his body, we're out of here. Again, this is why Peter and James and John are questioning among themselves what Jesus is talking about when he says, don't tell anybody about this until after I come up from among the dead. Because again, in their minds, they thought, he's dead. If he dies, we're not going to see him for whatever, thousands of years. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to come out of the, come out from among the dead on that third day. So verse 10, we read, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? In other words, they're questioning, why are you telling us, why are you commanding us not to tell anybody about what we saw? Because we just saw Elijah. 
And the Bible's clear. Elijah comes first. And then you're supposed to be here. And so why can't we? You, this is the promise of the Old Testament. Elijah's coming first. We just saw him with our own eyes. That's true. Look at the last two verses in the Old Testament. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord... And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The Jewish people totally believe, even to this day, and they teach Elijah is coming before the Messiah comes. Those of you that have participated in a Jewish Seder, you'll notice that they have an empty seat at the table. That empty chair is for Elijah. They've been practicing this for many, many centuries. And this is why they have that seat available. In case Elijah shows up. This is also why I and many others believe that Elijah is one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. They will be on the scene at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. They will have the ministry, and I think it's Elijah and Moses, the same ministry as Elijah and the Moses of the Old Testament, calling fire down from heaven, stopping the rain from falling for three and a half years. They will smoke and toast anybody that you know, disobeys them. And so I think we know Elijah is one of those two witnesses, calling people to repentance, telling people, do not receive the mark of the Antichrist. And so these three guys, Peter, James, and John, are not only wondering what Jesus meant about rising up from the grave, but they're wondering why we can't tell anybody about this because we just saw Elijah. He came first, so Jesus responds. Here's how he answers them. Verse 11, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. That's still future, still future for us. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Ah, the light bulb comes on. John the Baptist. He's the one that fulfilled that ministry of Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. Is that, that's exactly what the angel Gabriel told Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth about, you know, they were old, praying, they couldn't have a kid, and then, he, you know, Gabriel says, you're going to have a child, you're going to name him John, and he's going to become in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's what he tells Zacharias. So John did. He did exactly what he was supposed to do as a forerunner of the Messiah. John was not received, as Jesus mentioned here. They did to him whatever they wanted. They had him killed, beheaded, as we saw a few chapters ago. He said, just as John was not received, I won't be received. They will do to me what they did to him. They would, you know, Jesus would suffer at the hands of the political and religious leaders. But it was all necessary. Jesus had to come the first time as the, what, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He had to die as the final sacrificial, you know, sacrifice for us, for our sins. Blood had to be shed. It was Jesus' perfect blood shed on the cross for us. At his second coming, though, when Jesus returns, he's not coming as the Lamb. He's coming as, what? the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to be roaring. He's coming back. He's going to destroy his enemies, the enemies of God. And so an amazing scene indeed. And this was the epitome of what we call a mountaintop experience. They're on the mountain. They see him transfigured. They hear God's voice. They see Elijah and Moses. And, and they're like, that's why Peter wanted to stay. Let's build a couple tents. We want to stay up here. Nope. You can't stay on the mountaintop. You can't have that mountaintop experience. It doesn't last forever. You have to come down into the valley. Why? Because that's where the fruit is grown. That's where the sheep and cattle are raised, in the valley. That's where the hard things of ministry take place, in the valley. Most ministry takes place in the valleys of life. So verse 14, they come down. They're off the mountain. And when they had come to the multitude... 
a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, take note of that word, and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Now we also read this st same story in Mark and Luke's Gospels. And we have more additional insights into what's going on when they encounter this man and his child. We find out he's a little boy. Mark says the father says uh, his son is seized by a demon and he's thrown to the ground. He's thrown into the fire. He's thrown into the water. The, the enemy's trying to kill him. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. That's what Mark will tell us. Luke's gospel says, this father says, this is his only child. And it's a little boy. Just a, uh, It means a young child, probably, you know, 10 years old or under. It says the demon seizes him. The demon, you know, cries out and he convulses. That's what Luke tells us. Now, here in Matthew's account, it, it's really a bad translation of that word where it says, epileptic, he suffers severely. The Greek word should not be epileptic because epilepsy, as many of you know, it's a physical condition in the brain. It's not a demonic thing. So for centuries, people looked at people with epilepsy as, oh, they're demon-possessed. They're lunatics. Some translations calls this kid a lunatic. You know, they're just out of their mind. That's not what the Greek word means. It literally, the Greek word means he's moonstruck doesn't say anything about epilepsy. He's moonstruck. That was a demon possession term. That's what the enemy wants to do is cause people to be moonstruck or possessed. And we'll see this is brought on by demon possession. We'll see that this is the case because Jesus will cast the demon out of this young boy. If this was just a physical situation, Jesus would have simply touched him and would have healed him, just like he did with leprosy and so many other diseases. What we see here, it's a tragic picture of how Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And he certainly wants to destroy children. He will use many and any means possible to go after our kids. Our culture, it's in cooperation with the enemy big time. I mean, our culture has opened up Pandora's box, so to speak, when it comes to our children. Satan is using, and we'll look more at this next time, Lord willing, if we're still here. But chapter 18, he talks about, he warns about those who cause little ones that believe in Jesus to sin against Jesus, to turn their back, to just get caught up in sin, to stumble them. Jesus tells us, It'd be better to have a millstone hung around their neck and tossed into the sea than to cause one of those little ones who believe in me to stumble. Anyway, Satan is using everything. TV, movies, the internet. I just saw a statistic this week. 50, over 50% of every 12-year-old boy has been on pornography sites. 50% 12-year-old boys. That is a tragedy. He'll use anything. He'll use public schools to come against children. He'll try to pervert, twist their, the kids' hearts, their minds, teaching evolution. Oh, you didn't come from God. There's no creator. You came from a monkey. And then we wonder, why are our kids acting like animals? Because you're teaching them they came from a monkey. Come on. But whatever our children are going through, we need to be like this desperate father. We need to bring them to Jesus. Because it's the truth and reality of Jesus can, that can save them, that can set them free from this faithless, perverted generation. That's exactly what Jesus tells all parents and grandparents to do. Look at verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Now, if Jesus said this about that generation being faithless and perverted, what do you think he's thinking about our generation? We've taken wickedness and perversion and sin to a whole new level. Now between verses 17 and 18, this is where Jesus is going to cast the demon out of this child. And he's going to heal this kid. 
Mark gives us a few more insights. After Jesus says, bring him here to me, look at these verses starting in Mark 9, verse 20. It says, then they brought him to him. And when he had seen him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, that's the demon, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, fo foaming at the mouth. So he, Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. In other words, when he was just a little tot. And often he has thrown him both into the fire, trying to kill him, and into the water to destroy him. But if... The father says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I don't know about you, but I can certainly relate to this father. Lord, I believe. I know God can do all things. But so often I question whether he is willing, he wants to intervene on in this situation. I mean, I understand what he's saying here. I know Jesus can do all things, but how often do we question his willingness to do what we know he can do? Notice how Jesus turns this situation around to draw this man to faith. The Father says, if you can... But Jesus is essentially saying, wait a minute, it's not a matter of if I can. <laughs> I'm God, I can do all things. But he tells him, if you can, that's what he says back to the Father. Do you believe that I can help your son? Do you believe I can help you? Now that is where our faith kicks in. Are we willing to turn our issues, our problems, our struggles over to Jesus? Are we willing to turn it over to Jesus and trust Him with the results. And also, here's a key, and then trusting Him with the results, but then resting in what He says He's going to do. Can you trust Him to do what's best? The Apostle Paul, remember in 2 Corinthians 12, he had his thorn in the flesh. Whatever it is, maybe an eye condition. In 2 Corinthians 12, he pleads with God three times. And it literally means he's begging God to remove that thorn in the flesh. Remember what God tells him? Nope, not going to do it. And then he tells him, when you're weak, then you'll be strong, Paul. And Paul says, okay, most gladly then I'll rejoice in my infirmities that I might rest in the power of God upon me. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because Paul knew that was God's will for his life, to remain in that weakened condition. So Paul would not trust himself, but Paul would have to trust the Lord. That's where faith is. So many people today, they want to just like, I got this faith. Jesus better do it. Do what I want him to do. That's not faith. That's faith in yourself. Faith in your faith. That's the word of faith that is not true biblical faith. Faith in Christ to let him do what he wants to do. He is God, and we need to trust what he wants to do. So... This man is saying, Lord, I'm weak. Give me strength to truly believe that you want the best for me and my family. But I love his honesty. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Well, look at verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. So it's not a problem for Jesus. Jesus, if you can, of course I can. Again, Mark 9.25 gives us a little more detail what's happening here. It says, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, this demon, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So not only was his child healed and the demon was cast out, the demon couldn't come back. I'm sure that gave this father tremendous peace as well. What relief he experiences. What pain that father must have had, you know, just being helpless, watching your child. Can you imagine watching your son, your grandson, you know, just demon-possessed, nothing you could do, just wild eyes jumping into fire trying to drown the child? I mean, how 
brutal this must have been, tormenting this child day after day, month after month, year after year. And now finally, what peace, what joy, as a father can now look into his son's eyes and he knows his son is looking back into his eyes. His head's not spinning around or whatever they do. You know, his eyes aren't, you know, red flames coming out of him. I mean, he's looking into his son's eyes and he sees his son is back. His son is whole. No longer under the influence of an outside invader. Some of us can relate to that. You were once bound up in whatever sin, iniquity, whatever drug, whatever drink, whatever it might have been, but God has come and you're no longer under the influence of that. Whatever it may be. Look at verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there. Now, have you ever seen a mountain move from here to there? Or have you ever seen a tree just, by my faith, pluck it out of the ground and zip it over there and drop it back in? No, that's not what Jesus is referring to. He says, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the mustard seed is the smallest seed in the garden, you will have, say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. As Jesus says this, I, I can almost guarantee what's flashing through these disciples' mind was Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. This is where the Lord is giving a word to Zerubbabel. Look at these verses, Zechariah 4, 6 and 7. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. He was in charge of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We usually stop there. But he says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. He shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So this word from the Lord was to encourage Zerubbabel, keep rebuilding. He had been knocked down so many times. He had enemies on the outside, enemies within, and he was discouraged. And, and so they faced all this opposition. So God is letting him know it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. God is going to level the mountainous obstacles that are before you. That's what it refers to. Say to this mountain, be removed. There's obstacles that Satan's trying to block you from growing, from doing, for whatever he's called you to do. Satan's going to put obstacles there. By faith, we can move those obstacles. Rebuke it like the little... Sticker at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Rebuke it. Otto was in Chick-fil-A the other day, and he was in his truck in front of him had this, you know, fish in it. You know, the fish symbol? It said Satan in the middle of that fish. <laughs> said, Otto, rebuke that thing. <laughs> you don't go in Chick-fil-A without Satan sticker on your bumper. Come on now. <laughs> Hope his chicken nuggets were fried. No, just kidding. Anyway, so now if you have a truck with that symbol and you're here today, you need Jesus. <laughs> need to repent and get right with the Lord. So apart from Jesus, we can't do anything worthwhile for the kingdom of God. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do whatever He's called us to do. And that's the point. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Apart from Jesus, that's what Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we need to make that distinction. Lord, in my strength, I can't do it, but in your power, I can. It doesn't take great big faith to do what God has placed before us. We just need that little faith, that mustard seed size of faith to do what he's called us to do. Now, here's an interesting thing about seeds. Somehow, when you put a seed in the ground, it knows which way to go. Roots go down, little plant goes up. It's just the way it is. It knows which direction to go. It will always go towards the light. It will always respond to water because the water helps bring the nutrients from the soil into the roots, and that helps the plant to grow, and then it will begin to produce fruit. 
That's what we need, spiritually speaking. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Our lives get planted in good soil. We saw this back in Matthew 13. And if it's planted in that good soil, the Holy Spirit will water. The water of the Word will help produce that good fruit for the glory of the Lord. So whatever God wants us to do, He is the one who also enables us to do it. He has given us all that we need for life and godliness. He's given us His Word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He'll never, ever call you to do something and then back away and let you do it on your own. If He he calls you, like me, Jeff, I want you to start teaching my Word. You're going to be a pastor. If I would have said, okay, I'll take it from here, I would have been out of here 32 years ago. (laughs) We're entering our 33rd year. I mean, the only reason I'm up here is because of God enables a dummy like me to keep doing this. It's not me. It's the Lord. Nothing is impossible for us if we're walking with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not my will that I'm trying to accomplish, but it's His will that we want to see accomplished. He'll enable you to do it in the Spirit's power according to the truth of His Word. That's what verse 21 is all about. Look at that. He says, However, this kind, speaking of this demon, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. In other words, to walk in the power of the Spirit, we must be living a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Or to say it another way, if and when a crisis comes into our lives, we won't be prepared to handle it unless we are praying and fasting. What does that mean? Basically, prayer is keeping us attached to the Lord. Fasting is helping us get detached from the world. Very simple. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Well, how do we do that? We've got to be on our knees 24-7? No, Prayer simply means you're in constant contact with the Lord. God developed constant contact many years before whoever invented constant contact did. God wants us to be in constant contact. Just talk to Him about everything throughout the day. You know, that's what we, we're in prayer. Fasting is simply detaching from the fleshly, worldly things that keep us distracted from what God has called us to do. Simple way to summarize it, Luke 9, 23, where Jesus said to them, All, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Deny your flesh, take up your cross, die to your flesh, and follow Jesus. And he'll empower you to do what he wants you to do. Look at verse 22. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. It was just a little over a week earlier he told them the same thing, and that's when Peter interrupts, Lord, be far be it from you. This shall not happen to you. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus tells Peter. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You're trying to have a shortcut? No, I have to die. I have to be the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So when Peter or Jesus tells them again this time, notice it says they are exceedingly sorrowful. Why? Well, I think the biggest reason is they are only able to focus on his death And only Peter, James, and John are starting to understand what the resurrection really is about, coming up from among the dead. They're thinking, oh no, if he dies, we're not going to see Jesus again until the very end of the days. And and then maybe he'll get raised up the same time we are. I mean, that's what they're thinking. They didn't understand what coming up from among the dead meant. Jesus is the first fruits. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of people that live their lives like this today. Jesus is still on the cross. Jesus is still in the tomb, and how sad that is. Jesus died. You know why the gospel is such good news? Why we have joy? Why the gospel is power? Is because Jesus is alive today, risen from the dead. And it's only because he's alive today that he can offer people the free gift of eternal life. It's because he is alive today that we are alive with him presently. Look at these verses from Ephesians chapter 2. 
Starting in verse 4, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, but God, and it's in reference to, yeah, Satan was dragging us all around this world. We were just being led by the enemy. We were, you know, sons of wrath and children of, you know, wrath and all these things. And then he says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love and which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And, presently speaking, raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, because we're in Christ, we have access to His throne room of grace. It's not on the screen, but always remember Hebrews 4.16, where it says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find grace and mercy and help in our time of need. That's open 24-7, and it's only because we are alive in Christ, and Christ is living in us, and we can go with any situation, any problem, praise in His presence all time, at all time. So these disciples would be exceedingly sorrowful all the way up until that first Resurrection Sunday. Sunday, not morning for these guys, but in the evening, Jesus finally appears to them. Mary Magdalene and some of the other women saw Jesus rise early in the morning, but these guys, oh, we're not going to believe. And Thomas, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in his hand, my hand in his side. I'm not going to believe. And Jesus comes eight days later. Hey, Thomas, put your finger right there. Put your hand in this hole on my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. What did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He understood at that moment. It's all true. Only then would these disciples be filled with joy and gladness. One final scene here in uh, chapter 17. This is the only place this is found in the Gospels here in chapter 17, starting in verse 24. I think it's recorded by Matthew, because remember what he was? A what? Tax collector. So here's an interesting scene about the temple tax. And this is why you want Jesus to be your tax man. <laughs> when they came, had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. Now, this temple tax started by, was started by God back in Exodus 30, and it's where God told Every Jewish man, 20 and above, they had to pay half a shekel per year to the tabernacle at first and then to the Temple of Solomon. And it was to keep the temple going. It was just to keep the temple going. That was what it was for. When Annas and then Caiaphas, his son-in-law, became high priests, and they're wicked and horrible, they're taking this money to themselves. And so these guys are part of that group. Hey, we need the money for Caiaphas. And for Annas. And so it was a scam at this point, but they're wanting to know does Jesus pay this temple tax? Peter says, yes. Now, does Peter actually know Jesus does? I don't know. Or is he just guessing that Jesus does? Well, look at verse 25. And he said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. And so first he anticipates what Peter's going to say, and Peter was probably coming in the house to ask Jesus, uh, do you actually pay this tax? I don't, I don't know. But when Jesus is, you know, says this, the king takes taxes from the strangers, not from his own sons. Well, who's the king of kings? Jesus didn't have to pay this tax. He's the king of kings. The taxes were to keep his house going. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. The tabernacle and the temple were built to honor the Lord. So he goes, we don't need to pay this, but look at verse 27. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. A couple of things to take note of here. First he says, nevertheless, lest we offend them. 
Again, Jesus didn't have to do this, but he set aside his rights at this moment because he did not want this to be an issue that would stumble other people. He didn't have to do this. Some things are not worth arguing about. Some things are not worth fighting over, as we've seen over the last two years. This is one of those times he says, hey, let's give them what they want. So he gives them this coin. Notice, though, Jesus tells Peter to go fishing. 99.9% .9 of the time, how did they fish? With a net. Here he says, take a hook and drop it in the sea. And you're going to catch a fish. The first fish that you catch, it's going to have a piece of money in its mouth. The, the word piece of money, it literally says a stater. A stater was a silver coin worth exactly the temple tax for two people. So Jesus is saying, you're going to pull up a fish. He's going to have this stater coin in his mouth, and that's going to pay the tax for the temple for you and for me. Amazing. I mean, this is amazing. So what's he doing here? You got a problem? Take it to Jesus. Got a tax issue? Take it to Jesus. There's a lot of 1-800 numbers I'm sure you can call. Yeah, if you're $50,000 in debt, just call us and... Well, we get it down to 5000 bucks. Well, Jesus has a better plan. But at any given time, the Jews say that there are approximately 10 million fish in the Sea of Galilee at any given moment. That's pretty good odds. But we're seeing the sovereignty of God here at work. Put in a hook. First fish you catch, pull it up. And once you take the hook out of its mouth, reach in and you'll find a coin that'll pay yours and my taxes. I mean, this is incredible. Now, I've, I've heard stories about this because this is a type of tapia fish that's in the Sea of Galilee. If you go there, they got it's called Peter's fish, and they're, I don't like them, but you can eat them if you want. Emily likes them because they're nasty fish like they have in India. So anyway, the thing about some tapias like these, when they have their babies, and they're tiny, and their eggs hatch, and they have their tiny little babies. If something spooks them, the mother will open her mouth, and the babies go inside her mouth, and she closes her mouth to protect them. Now, listen, when those little fish become teenagers, and something spooks them, what, what's the mama fish do? She doesn't open her mouth. You don't want teenagers in your mouth. She, <laughs> they'll immediately take a pebble from the bottom. And so the fish can't get in because that pebble's blocking it. And so here's this fish. The hook drops down, probably spooks the little guys. Want to get in the mouth. Fish drops down, pulls up a stator. And so it's in its mouth. For whatever, whatever's on that hook, it really entices that fish because it takes the hook. Peter pulls it up. Take the hook out. Reach in. Oh, there's a coin just for the temple tax. This is incredible. Here's Jesus. He was just on the mountaintop with Elijah and Moses in glory. He comes down the mountain with Peter, James, and John. He's confronted by demons. He's confronted by tax collectors. Not much difference. But he stoops all the way down to where they are. Jesus stoops down to where these guys are. Again, there's nothing too big, nothing too small that Jesus cannot handle. And I'm sure that Peter, I know that Peter, through the next 35 years or so, before he was crucified upside down for his faith, he looked back on this scene in chapter 17, and he held fast to what Jesus is saying, the glory of the Lord, the simple things Jesus did, Jesus would never leave Peter. He'd never forsake him. And I'm sure through all the trials and all the persecutions, Peter was able to say, Jesus has got this. He, he's got my life in his hands. I'm safe and secure with the Lord. I'm going to close with these verses from 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Again, this is just before Peter will be put to death for his faith in the Lord. Looking back, again, 35 plus years or so from when we just what we just read in Matthew 17, 
Peter says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We're not, we're not following some fairy tale. We were eyewitnesses. For he received from God, Jesus received from God the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter left off the last two words where God said, Hear him to Peter. So Peter's like, yeah, I did. I listened. So he doesn't add that part. But this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy is of, of Scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter never forgot what he had seen, what he had learned, what he had heard. And Jesus carried him through all of life's ups and downs, trials and struggles, good times and hard times. And he does the same for all of us because we are all members of the same body of Christ that Peter was, that John was, that James was, all those disciples, except for Judas. But Jesus loves us, and he's with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And we have that same confidence with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now and in Russia, because I can't imagine being in Russia as a believer. I mean, pray that God would take Putin out. Or is God going to use Putin to pull him down into Israel? I don't know. God's timing. He's on the throne. So just keep trusting the Lord and keep leading people to Jesus.